So good to see you all. Um, Ryan has uh, muted everybody by necessity. It's just really hard to get everybody to be conscious of the need to mute. And we don't want to hear background noises that maybe we shouldn't be hearing in your space. So we've made it easy by muting everybody for now. We also aren't using the chat room, but there will be opportunities to ask questions when we're done with the presentation part of, of today. And you know, we have two hours allocated today. There's no way that I'm going to talk that long or that Margo is going to talk that long. So I'm confident that we will have time to take some questions and still get everybody back to work um, before the end of the designated period, before four o'clock. So welcome, if you're tight on time, stay with us as long as you can. If you need to take a break at any time, uh, don't forget to turn your camera and audio off before you take your break, uh, but feel free to do that and come on back and pop in as you'd like. Um, I wanna thank everybody for being here. It is so nice of you to attend uh, what is always a voluntary meeting, but it says something about our need for community when 271 people come together in a Zoom room to see each other's faces and to hear each other talk and to remember uh, what our college looks like. It is the people that make us up, not the buildings, as I sometimes like to say, even though those buildings are getting nicer and nicer. But it is nice to see and more important for us to see the people. So hello, people. Hello, my family. Hello, Saddleback friends and family. It is so good to see you. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, a few people in the room. I've seen uh, a number of our trustees uh, and a number of people from district. I see President Milchiker. Uh, I saw Trustee Jamal, uh, I saw Trustee Jay, uh, let's see, am I missing anyone? Raise your hand if I'm missing you. Chancellor Burke is here. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, hello, Kathleen. Hello, Dr. Burke. Uh, I also saw Vice Chancellor Viscachil here. Cindy, note the shirt with the sport jacket, both are prints. That's a joke just between me and Cindy. Uh, and anyone else who is also important, which means uh, 200 and, oh, now we're over 300 people in the room. Um, you are all important, and I am so glad that you all chose to be here this afternoon and spend some time together. So here's what we're going to do today. Um, there's no guest speaker. It's just me and Margot, and uh, Shuka is going to join me in a little bit and talk to us about some data uh, that she and I have been working on and wanted to share with you. Um, but you are the special speakers. We are the special speakers. We are here to talk to each other and so share some information. Uh, and here's what I thought I would share with you today. So first, I don't think we can even have a meeting these days uh, without me talking a little bit about COVID, where we are and where we're going from here, why we're out and why we might come back at some point in the future, um, because that's important to our students and all of us, of course. Uh, after we talk a little bit about COVID, uh, I wanted to talk just very briefly to remind us all of the work that a lot of people did on the Aspen application to go forward in Aspen, uh, should we become a finalist in the future. But more importantly, what we learned from that work and filling out that application and how that might inform and shape how we move forward in our efforts to achieve student success for all. Um, I also want to share in so far as sharing some of the learnings of the application for Aspen, um, where we're doing really well based on, you know, how we assessed ourselves for that application and where we still have some opportunities to grow and particularly doing so vis-a-vis um, -vis data that shows where we're doing well and where we still have some opportunities. Because as I've been saying for a long time, and you all are sick of me saying, it's really important that we use that data, that we be data informed in our decision making. It doesn't mean that qualitative data, that anecdotes should be dismissed, but primarily we need to look at data because it's going to be far more important in shaping how we allocate resources and where we put our priorities, because there's just so many hours in the day. Um, after that, I'll wrap up and then I'm going to pitch it uh, to Dr. Lovett, to Margot Lovett, the president of the Academic Senate. This is, after all, our traditional presidents with the apostrophe after the S, welcome. And I know that Margot has some words to say to welcome us all too. So that's the agenda today. Um, and I hope at least one or more of those topics are of interest to you. So let's start with COVID because COVID is interesting to everybody, but in a negative way. Uh, we are all sick of it, and yet um, it's probably the first thing we look to on whatever news source 
uh, we turn to in the morning. And in my case, uh, when I go to bed at night, I know that's probably not a very good habit, is it? Um, so when we're not doom scrolling, uh, I, I like to check some data from the county and I have some fresh data uh, to share with us for today. But I think it's important to review where we are. Of course, we're tapping on the brakes yet again. I know people are tired of us tapping on the brakes, um, but I think everybody in the room, at least almost everybody in the room probably sees the need for that. Um, at this point in time, where, relative to where we are today. So right now we're tapping on the brakes to yet again flatten the curve. So what does that mean? It means that there is a rise in the number of cases, and with it, about two weeks later, there will be uh, a rise in the number of more serious symptoms that will lead to a rise in two to three weeks after the rise in cases and a rise in hospitalizations. And following that, about four weeks later, there will be a rise in deaths. And the rise in cases is happening really quickly and really rapidly. So what we've been waiting to see um, really for the last couple of weeks and we're just starting to see is how will the rise in hospitalizations and deaths follow that rise in cases? And I'll talk a little bit about that today. But here's the good news overall. So far, we are not seeing uh, a commensurate proportionate rise in hospitalizations for pneumonia and deaths at the same proportion as the rise in cases, which is a good thing because with the number of cases we're seeing that's completely unprecedented, there's no way we would have the hospital capacity to take care of those people. So what we're hoping for and really watching every day is whether the models show that we're gonna exceed our existing hospital capacity or whether this is gonna work, whether we can flatten the curve, flatten out that rise in cases, which means prolonging it, unfortunately, long enough to not hit up against the capacity of our hospitals. So here's where we are as of today, and this will help explain, of course, in case you needed more reasons for why we're out right now, or at least why 90% of us are out, this will help reinforce some of that and validate Dr. Burke's decision, not that that requires any validation at this point. So from Saturday until Monday, we had a total of 23,000 cases. Yes, I'm gonna use all these cards till I finish the pack. I bought 50 of them, so I'm gonna use them all. We had 23,000 COVID cases, positive cases reported at the county level. Now we're way behind where other parts of the country are in Europe. Are. We're about two to three weeks behind Europe and a good week or two behind even LA in terms of where their trend has gone. And I've been kind of waiting to see why our numbers weren't worse than they were, because LA is just a storm. It's really, really bad in LA in terms of the number of cases. And Sunday, I was sharing this with other people today. Sunday, I took, we took my mother-in-law out to, uh, to uh, the outlet mall in, uh, in San Juan, uh, because we go to the, the fish restaurant there, Slapfish, if any of you go to it, not an endorsement. We just happen to like it. It's not an endorsement for Slapfish, but they have an outdoor eating area. So it's one of the few safe places where we can go and you can spread yourself out. It's not all tight tables in a little courtyard. It's a big courtyard, you can move the tables. So myself or my partner go in and order, and then we set my mother-in-law out and we can have a restaurant meal with her outside uh, in this mall. So as we're walking to the courtyard where the eating area is, we're walking past the stores. And people walking mostly aren't wearing masks. I usually don't wear my mask unless it starts getting densely populated outside. But I looked inside the stores and there were people shopping in the stores without masks. And I said to myself, this is insane. Like, is nobody reading a newspaper? How at this point in time can you be walking around inside a store without a mask? Even if you don't feel vulnerable yourself, what about the fact that so many people carry Omicron without ever knowing that they have the disease? How about thinking about others in your community, right? So let me get off that soapbox and make my point. I, I kind of knew from that point on, oh, we're about to see a giant increase in Orange County cases because this kind of behavior will transmit the disease really quickly. And that's exactly what's happening. So we had 23,000 over Saturday to Monday, yet today we tacked on another 5,000 cases. So we're starting to see those metrics go up that we've been talking about that we used in fall to decide when to tap the brakes and when to release the brakes. 
So remember in fall, the metric we talked about, the number of new cases per 100,000, do you remember what our threshold was? It was 10. When the number got above 10, we tapped the brakes and held students from coming back. When the number fell below 10, we brought the rest of the students back and we made it without hitting 10 again, right up until the end of the semester. Today, that number that we use 10 as the threshold for is 108. It's 108 per 100,000. This is an unprecedented rise in the number of cases per day. We are gonna have a lot of people sick over the next couple of weeks. And I am very glad that we have tapped on the brakes and are reducing the risk for the people who absolutely need to be on campus during this time, including some of you, thank you for being there, and including some students who have to come back for labs and activity classes where we simply can't achieve the student learning outcomes holding them out at home. The other metric we talked about in fall was positivity rate. And positivity rate is considered future looking, forward looking. It kind of tells us what the next couple of weeks are gonna look like. And the metrics threshold that we used in fall was 5% positivity. When positivity fell below 5%, we felt it was safe enough to bring more students back on campus. And when it was above that, we felt it necessary to tap the brakes. Today, the positivity rate in Orange County is over 25%. One in four people who get tested are testing positive. So if you're in line to get tested, you might wanna keep some distance from the people in front and behind you at this rate. It's, it's pretty bad out there, so please be careful. Now here's the good news. And from this point on, it's pretty good news because those numbers are super scary in terms of the number of cases and how fast this wave is going up. It is straight up. I have never seen a wave like this in COVID modeling. It is almost vertical at this point. But here's the good news. Increasingly, it is looking like, and you know this because you're reading this too, it is looking like this virus has a predilection for the cells of the upper respiratory tract and not so much for the cells of the lungs. So viruses, you know, viruses think of, you know, people talk about them like they're intelligent. The, the COVID virus is trying to get us. It's trying to figure out ways to get in. Like it's a, it's a couple of proteins and a little chain of nucleotides that it's the genetic code, right? And the evolution of a virus through mutations is completely random when it happens to make a mistake in its replication that helps it get into cells, that replication is more likely to propagate itself because it will infect more cells and be replicated. And when a mutation makes it less effective at that, it won't be replicated, so that mutation is more likely to go away. So evolution is the result of random changes. And in the case of the virus, they're just chemical changes, just little mutations. But here's the thing about viruses. Over time, the trend is they will evolve to become more transmissible, but less severe. So think about that for a minute, because it makes sense. If a virus, if evolution is about propagating more, if you're more transmissible, you can invade more cells and replicate yourself. So the, the mutations that make a virus more transmissible will be more likely to be sustained. So over time, the mutations are completely random, but over time, we're gonna move toward greater transmissibility. But mutations will also evolve to be less severe. Why? If you kill your host too quickly, you're not gonna replicate. If your host is not even sick enough to be out of work, your host now goes to work and spreads the virus to more people. That means more replication of virus and more success in terms of those mutations, right? Now we have sustained mutations. So viruses tend to become less severe and more transmissible. And that's always been predicted for COVID, but it's just that it's not a smooth line toward increased transmissibility and less severity. It's got ups and downs. So we've had ups and downs where it became more or less severe just by slight gradations and more or less transmissible. But the thing with Omicron that you all know by now is it's much more transmissible, between two and 300% more transmissible because it's very good at getting inside those cells in the upper respiratory tract. And when I say getting in a cell, think of you know a cell as a closed structure, like a, like a gated community. And the virus 
has a protein that by virtue of its shape is like a code. And if it, co if it got the right code to open the gate, the gate will open up to the cell and it will get into the cell and invade, right? And this virus, this variant, Omicron, has the code down for getting into those upper airway cells, just like cold or flu. It's very good at it. It's very transmissible. But along the way, as it got these mutations from Delta to Omicron, it seems not so good anymore at opening the, the gate for the lung cells. That's a slightly different code. It uses some of the same numbers, but not all of them. And therefore it got less able to get into the lung cells. So we're seeing that in the data where the severity is not as bad for everyone, not just the vaccinated, but I'm gonna distinguish those in just a minute because it's not as quick to get into the lung cells. But it still can. And you know, when we talk about upper versus lower airway, it's not a clean cutoff, like it's a transition down. So getting into some airway cells can take it pretty far down in our airway. And for some people get into the lungs, especially people who don't have super strong immune systems. So there are differences now between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. There always have been, right? But if you ever needed validation for becoming among the vaccinated and then for getting boosted. If you're, if you're boosted, let me give you some statistics to help you out. So, you know, I heard, I just got a letter today. I just saw a letter today from an angry parent. I get angry parent letters about the vaccine mandate saying, hey, why are you doing this to my poor son who just had Delta a couple months ago and now is being told has to be vaccinated. That's not even true because he's got antibodies. Well, first of all, those antibodies from Delta have been shown to be terribly ineffective against Omicron. But equally as important, this parent said, hey, what are you guys even doing? Don't you know that the vaccinated people are just as likely to get Omicron as the unvaccinated? That's wrong. That is just wrong. It is pure, unadulterated misinformation. So the current number, is if you are vaccinated, and as I look across the room now, I can say this with confidence, 98% of you are vaccinated. We have 2% of our employee workforce that has exemptions and 98% of us are vaccinated. And most of those are what would I call optimally vaccinated, which means if they're eligible, they've also had a booster. And of you all 98%, of us all 98%, our chance of getting COVID relative to someone who is unvaccinated is between one fourth to one sixth of the odds, meaning someone who's vaccinated relative to someone's unvaccinated has a much lower chance of even getting COVID. And that's because the vaccination with a booster is about 70% effective in preventing even the transmission of the disease. And those other 30% of the cases is where the vaccine just has not been as effective in preventing transmission, but is still 90% plus effective in presenting severity of disease. So where's the research in terms of the benefits of vaccination in preventing severity of disease? Well, right now, and this is Omicron, if you are vaccinated and optimally vaccinated, your odds of being hospitalized are 1 20th to 1 38th. The 38 times more likely to be hospitalized is a California statistic, the 20th is national relative to someone who's unvaccinated. So someone who's unvaccinated at this point is four to six times more likely to get COVID and they are 20 to 38 times more likely to end up in the hospital. So when I talk to all of you now from this point forward, I get to talk to you with the assumption that you're vaccinated and you're probably boosted because we're down to about 2% that have exemptions to vaccination and we're at least gonna test those folks to help them. And we're gonna do what we can to keep them safe. But the focus has to be on the 98% of you that are vaccinated. And if you're eligible for booster, I hope you would also be boosted. So the good news is for all of you, your odds of experiencing a severe case of COVID are extremely low. And yes, there are cases, there are still 16, 17% of people in hospitals with COVID who have been vaccinated, but the vast majority in the hospital are the unvaccinated. And that just says something because they make up a minority in the population, but a huge majority in the hospital. So for all of us, it's time to breathe. It's time to relax just a little bit 
about our fear of dying of this disease. It's very, very unlikely. It's very, very unlikely that any of us as vaccinated, as optimally vaccinated, will experience a severe case of COVID as long as Omicron is the dominant variant or if future mu mutations are as unsevere, if you will, forgive me for, for that botching of the English language, are, are as mild, if you will. And that's the trend in mutations is to become less severe, not more severe. Now that could change, but we're, we already have pharmaceutical companies working on new vaccines against Omicron that are far more likely to be effective against the next mutation because Omicron had all these mutations we had never seen in the first vaccine that now will be in the next one such that whatever additional mutations we get in any future variant will probably be covered sufficiently by the one that's developed for Omicron. So if this is starting to sound familiar, it should. We have a disease like this in our midst. It's called influenza. And many public health officials have waited for the time that we could have the conversation that I'm about to have with you. There will be a point where we can start thinking about Omicron, not as a pandemic that is killing hundreds of thousands of people per year, but rather something that looks more like influenza. It's an endemic. It is something that changes over time, such that we will need new vaccinations from time to time and be boosted. And we will still experience people with severe cases, often the very elderly and immunocompromised. And we will still have people die of this disease. You know, influenza kills between 20 in a good year and 40,000 in a bad year in America. Many people don't realize that. That's almost as many people that die in car crashes. We're very conscious of safety rituals to keep us safe in our cars, but we don't have any sort of protocols or the kinds of attention being paid to this pandemic as for influenza. And, and that's fine because we've decided that that amount of illness and death, 20 to 40,000 people, not a small number, is unfortunately acceptable, it's tolerable. It's, it's where we land as a society in saying, we're willing to take this much risk but when it gets above this, when it gets to 800,000 in COVID, no, 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 we're going to do severe stuff. We're going we're gonna to have vaccine mandates. We're going to close down businesses temporarily. We're going we're gonna to make people wear masks indoors. We're going to do things to protect folks because that's a whole different ballpark. But when we, in the future, start feeling secure that this is looking like influenza, we have to think about a world and a time where we're treating it that way, where COVID becomes the thing that changes over time comes in waves and we take new vaccinations and new boosters to protect ourselves. And maybe during high seasons, we take some precautions like wearing masks again, maybe even for short periods of time, tapping on the brakes to minimize the wave and the spread in our businesses and in our, in our colleges. But we do have to think about a future time where the lives of our students and ourselves do move on. Are we there today? Clearly not. Clearly the numbers say we are a long way from there. But that's the paradox of where we sit today. We sit in a roller coaster car hearing the click, click, click as we climb uphill of a giant wave. It is terrifying. It is awful. But the ride is going to come to an end on the other side, or at least the hills are going to be much smaller and the stakes will be much lower. And we are going to approach that time in the near future. So I am more positive today than I have been in the last 21 months, even though I am sharing with you record numbers, the likes of which I have never seen. How weird is that? It couldn't get any much worse in the spread of cases right now. Yet I see in front of us a very clear horizon with a sun poking through. And I am not speculating and I am not being Pollyannish. I am looking at data, I am looking at science, and I am here to tell you that our future is bright and we have an endemic ahead of us, if not with this variant, then with the next one or the one after that, and we will make it to the endemic stage and we will live with this virus and our lives will go on and the lives of our students will get back to normal so that we can serve them. So that is my message about COVID today. It is oddly optimistic in the face of very scary numbers, because we have to be realistic about where we sit. 
which right now does not justify us being back on campus. But we also have to be realistic about coming back at some point in the near future, because there will be a time for us to come back and do so safely. And when we do, we will be safe and we will take precautions and we will watch numbers. But are we going to return to the same metrics as some have suggested that we used in fall? That will ultimately be the decision of the district and of Chancellor Burke. But my own feeling about that is we may have to relook at different kinds of numbers. It may be more realistic to look at hospital capacity and whether there are enough ventilators available than it is to look at number of cases when the number of cases are almost all mild going forward. And for most people who keep up with their vaccinations going forward, they will almost all be mild cases. Now, one more thing I wanna say. I don't want this to be construed as, hey, I should just go out and get Omicron. Elliot says it's really not that bad. I have no chance of getting a severe disease. And what the heck, let's just get it over with. And you know what? I've had that thought from time to time. But here's why you shouldn't think that way. Here, if there are any Omicron parties, and I hope there are not, you should not go to an Omicron party. Here's why. First, what we don't know yet is whether Omicron, even though very short-lived and mild for the 98% of us that are optimally vaccinated, even though it is likely to be mild, we don't know if it still has long COVID. And you know what I mean by long COVID, those symptoms that go on for a number of people. It's too early to tell whether people who recover from Omicron will have long COVID. So it's too early to blow this off as just a mild illness that's like flu and you'll get over it. We don't know yet. The early indications are that that's the case, that you have to have pretty significant disease to develop long COVID symptoms. And because those kinds of significant symptoms are really only in the unvaccinated, it's unlikely that any of you would experience them, the 98% of you that are vaccinated. Second, if case you need another reason not to try to get Omicron at this point. The theory of getting a disease that many people espouse to today, usually from bad information sources, is that you'll develop antibodies to the disease, just like a vaccination induces, maybe more powerful ones, as some claim, that will then protect you against Omicron and perhaps future variants. And you know, as a herd, as a community, um, there is some truth to that. Each of these thousands of people that are catching Omicron every day, they will help us bring that wave down because as the virus is looking for new hosts, it's going to run out if it finds someone who's had Omicron in the last few weeks because they will almost always have antibodies to it that will prevent them from getting sick again. So when we hit that plateau of the curve and then start descending, we should be thanking all of the people who got vaccinated and all of the people who got sick, and we hope it's not severe, but those people who got sick will develop antibodies that will make it more difficult for this disease to find new hosts, and they will help us to send the wave. But here's the thing about Omicron. Most Omicron cases, particularly among the vaccinated, have been mild cases. And what scientists are starting to question about COVID is whether you develop decent antibody protection at all let alone, let alone long-term immunity, when you have a mild infection of COVID. In other words, the people who have developed the strongest antibody response have been the people who've been in hospitals, who've had severe disease, and they may be immune for weeks or even months. But the people who get mild cases, which would be most of the vaccinated and some of the unvaccinated, we don't know whether they're going to get antibodies that would even last more than the course of their disease. They could be getting COVID, Omicron, and then experience Omicron again a few weeks later. The antibodies tend to be very short-lived. So this idea that natural immunity is better than vaccination-induced immunity, I gotta tell you, it's just, it's just nonsense. It's not supported by science, but particularly with Omicron. It doesn't look like in the case of mild disease, you develop much of an antibody response. It may be enough to get us over the wave, but it's not gonna help you sustain your immunity. The best thing to keep your immunity going where we are today would be, and we'll see where the timing goes, either get our fourth shots, which is our next booster. And so far, as you know, that's happening in Israel. And there's probably a coming recommendation for our CDC for sometime around four or five months after the last booster. Or, and these times are going to be pretty close for a lot of us, 
wait for the new vaccine that will have the new Omicron variant as part of its target. So that's why I say we're getting to the endemic phase where you don't wanna have the disease, you wanna be looking forward to the next scientific approach to it, which is gonna be the next booster that will get us to this next step. And bless them, you know, whatever you think of big pharma, we are safe today and we do not have to fear death because of the work of big pharma and the research that big pharma has done. So we are very grateful for that. And I will be first in line as a scientist and knowing all I know about vaccinations and big pharma and this disease, I will be first in line when I am eligible for either my next booster or for that new vaccine that will come out for Omicron. So lots of good news. The future is good. Don't go out and get Omicron today. Try to avoid it. Stay safe. And we've talked about all the ways to do that. And the most important thing right now is to upgrade your mask. Think about using either a high, a high filtration medical mask if you have one, or much research has shown that you can get the equivalent of an N95 filtration rate simply by using a surgical mask and then putting a tightly drawn cloth mask over it. Not just a cloth mask, cloth mask alone are not even recommended anymore, but a surgical mask with a tighter cloth mask over it to create a better seal over the parts that tend to be open. That seems to be as effective as an N95. So. Um, I'm a little reluctant to buy N95s. I did buy a box at Costco, but it'll probably be the last one I buy until the healthcare crisis portion of this wave is over because I'm a little concerned about us taking stock away from healthcare institutions that may need them. Um, but if you have some or you see some at your store and someone else is gonna buy them, if you don't, you may as well buy them, but otherwise you can achieve the same result with a surgical mask and a cloth mask over it. All right, that's enough COVID talk. If you have questions about anything that I've talked about or anything I have said, we will have room at the end uh, to try to answer those questions. Right now though, I wanna spend uh, the remainder of this hour um, talking a little bit about data and the importance of data in our approaches to increasing student success. Um, so here's the thing, you know, we were nominated for an Aspen and that's, you can't nominate yourself, no person nominates you. You're nominated by virtue of data sets that are reviewed by the Aspen Institute um, that tell them you have made significant gains in your student achievement. And they look at specific data sets and they're not always forthcoming about what they look at, but we kind of have a sense of what they look at and why we became a top 150 school as did our sister college IBC. And we went forward and then signed up for the next phase. We wanna be considered for finalist. And many schools who are in top 150 don't move forward because it's a lot of work to move forward as a potential finalist. It requires a very long application equivalent to a long grant. And we had a team who have worked on this diligently and kudos to, uh, let's see, I wanna, I'm afraid of calling people out because I'm gonna forget some important people in here, but certainly uh, Roxanne, Shuka, Tram, uh, Nick, all of your teams, all of the other folks who contributed data and contributed, uh, I don't want to forget Claire for the faculty portion, instruction portion, all of the folks who supported this work in the application, I am great, very grateful for that work. And even though it is unlikely we will be a finalist, because very rarely do schools reach finalists in their first up, first time nominated, even though that's not really the goal, that would be great if we did, um, it's really to learn from that application. So I'd like to tell you in just a half minute what we learned. Here's what we learned. We are really good at some things and we have really made a difference. We have really moved the dial in a lot of our measurements of student success. We deserve to be top 150. They didn't make a mistake. They looked at the right data and they got it right. But here's where we have some growth to do, some, some opportunities. We, in some cases, have come out with initiatives and we've been lucky that they worked. What we didn't necessarily do is a more systematic approach or an intentional approach that Aspen likes to see, where you look at your data, you look at your college, and you say, here's where we have opportunities. Here's where barriers exist. Here's what the data shows. Here's the new project or new activity under an initiative that we'd like to do to address it. And now here's a way of assessing it with data to see if we've been successful. We have done that with a number of projects, but they really want to see colleges moving to that. And when I say they, we're not trying to make Aspen Institute happy. That's not the goal here. But the colleges that have been Aspen winners have moved the dial measurably 
on student achievement. They have, they have you know, doubled their rates of transfer and completion. They have closed equity gaps. There's a reason this approach works. I, we are not trying to win the equivalent of the Oscar for the, the value of the medal. We are trying to win the Oscar because we're trying to give our best performance and do our best for students. And it just so happens that following the, 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 the desires of the Aspen Institute is going to align with what's gonna help us get there. So that more intentional approach that's data informed is where we wanna go. So I think it begins today with looking at data and with identifying where we've been successful in moving the dial by virtue of closing equity gaps, by increasing student success for all, increasing completions, increasing transfer, and where we still have some opportunities. So I asked Chuka uh, just before break to come out and join me and talk to us about this. And Chuka is gonna do that in just a minute. But first, um, I wanna congratulate Chuka and welcome a couple of other folks as well before we talk about data. So first, we haven't had a formal announcement because the board just approved Chuka's new contract at their last meeting, but Chuka is no longer interim director of Oprah. Chuka is now our permanent director. So congratulations, Chuka. It's so nice to have you in that role. No one knows this college and Oprah and our needs more than you, and you have the vision to get us where we want to go. And while I'm congratulating Shuka on her permanent position, I want to welcome a couple of other additions to my team as well. Uh, so first, um, before the break, we had some good news, bad news from Anthony Maciel. Anthony is going to be moving on to a new position with a new opportunity, uh, and we are very excited for him, and we are very sad to see him go, but I want to thank Anthony for the work he's done at our college and moving our technology so far as he has. We will miss him, and we will never be able to fill his shoes. Uh, but we also recognize that people want to grow and move up. And when we don't have those opportunities, we want to make sure we support them and moving on if they want to. So we stand behind you, Anthony. We will miss you, but we're so grateful for the time we had with you at Saddleback. So I want to thank Anthony, but I also want to welcome our interim director of, of IT. Uh, and that is where I need my little list, Sylvia Lynch. Uh, so Sylvia is in the room. Wave, Sylvia, say hi. Uh, and people can scan and find Sylvia and welcome her. Can't emphasize enough the importance of us reaching out individually and welcoming new people because it's so hard to feel welcome when you're starting remote. Um, but in this case, I, I hope you will reach out to Sylvia and welcome her. We're so grateful that she will be in this position temporarily while we find a permanent new IT director, not to replace, but maybe fill a little bit of the shoes um, that Anthony left behind for us. But thank you so much, Sylvia, for standing in and serving in that role. And then I wanna also uh, welcome another direct report from my team, and that is Anna McDonald. So Anna, I see she's on my first screen. I don't know where she is for you. Way bigger than that, not a little wave, Anna. You're not a queen, give us a big wave. There you go. Um, Anna is joining us as our new uh, Director of Outreach and Strategic Partnerships, or Director of OSP as I'm calling it, uh, kind of a new bigger view of how we do outreach at our college and what outreach means and what our new audiences are as we move forward. Anna comes to us with great experience, not only in conventional kinds of outreach, uh, but also in creating industry partnerships in her relationships uh, with K-12 and dual enrollment programs. Um, and she comes to us most recently uh, after working uh, just recently at the Orange County Board of Education. So lots of connections in our county, gonna be very important for us in building new partnerships. So welcome Anna as well. We're very glad to have you in this role. So again, please do your best, particularly if you have any interaction with these folks to make them feel welcome. Uh, again, I just can't reiterate enough how difficult it is for us to do our jobs of making our family feel like uh, they have joined something important when they only see us on Zoom. So reach out and say hi in any way you can. Uh, until February 7th or whenever we do ultimately come back. So I, I wanna put those welcomes uh, in there, but now I wanna bring Shuka in um, and we're gonna go over a little bit of data with you. And if you hate data, and if you really don't wanna engage in data, okay, get a break. It's gonna take us about 20 minutes if you wanna come back. But let me just say this, this is pretty cool data. You might wanna stick around and actually see this data. I think you're gonna be impressed with some things we're doing and what we're calling for in terms of new opportunities ahead. So Shuka, with that in mind, do you wanna share the little deck we put together? I do. Thank you so much, Elliot, for the warm welcome as well. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. 
Okay. So we thought today um, that we would focus on our DEI work um, in looking at data, because as we went through the Aspen application, I think we identified areas where we were very strong and areas where we knew we needed to focus more in the future. And DEI was certainly in that latter group. So I want to talk about some of the big successes in the data that we have in DEI, and then talk about where we might have some opportunities to close. So when we say DEI, we of course mean diversity, equity, and inclusion. And those are three different things, and we should be conscious of that. And you know, we often talk about equity and we know that there's data for equity, but there's also data for diversity and inclusion. And people will often say, well, we're not very diverse or we're not very inclusive, but they're often not referring to data when they make those statements. So one of the things I asked Shuka to do is to help us figure out where are we in diversity and inclusion, not just in equity. So we're gonna start there. So Shuka, are we as diverse as the communities we serve? How do we look like? Does our complexion look like? Does our gender makeup look like the community we serve? Or are there gaps because people don't wanna to come to Saddleback because they have access issues as we sometimes call them? How are we looking in our student population compared to our community? Is there a way of us doing that? Thank you, Elliot. Um, so first, when we address access to college, uh, we first looked at the demographics by ethnicity within all of Orange County, because we want to see, we want to ensure that our student population is reflective of the community we serve. So the chart you're looking at right now shows the distribution of residents in Orange, in all of Orange County in comparison to the students we serve. Based on these distributions, we do notice that there's a slight overrepresentation of white students and underrepresentation of Latinx and Asians among our students compared to the county as a whole. Now, these differences can be attributed to the density of residents from certain groups within different areas of the county. For example, we know that North Orange County, which is not in our service area, has higher Latinx and Asian populations uh, than South County. So what happens when we look at our college's service areas? So when we compare our student population to that of our college service area, which is inclusive of 10 neighboring cities, and I've marked them at the bottom here, Aliso Viejo, Dana Point, Ladera Ranch, and so on, we notice that there's a shift in the demographics where our college serves higher proportions of students from Latinx, Black, African-American, and Asian groups than those who reside in our service areas, implying that access to college from our minority groups is not really a barrier. Uh, one thing that we will investigate in the future is, as an additional thought, is do we represent, do our students reflect graduates from our local feeder high schools. So this is an area that we will be looking at because we do want to entice those students to come to the college. Do we really mirror uh, the students that are coming from our high schools? Um, beyond that, I feel that obviously access implying that we have these, this, these representative groups, we don't really have an access issue when it comes to diversity. So uh, Shuka, can I ask a question about that? So for instance, when we look at, I mean, I often look at that 2% number for us. So we only have 2% um, students who identify Black or African American and say like, what is up? Like we are clearly giving off some bad vibe, but it's 1% in the community. So we, we do have a community issue. We have access issues that are bigger than our college, but in terms of our college, it, it looks like we are properly represented. Is that what this is telling me? Yes, yes, you are correct, Elliot. Uh, given the, our neighboring cities and our service areas, we are definitely meeting the needs of our Black African-American students that we serve at the college. Yes. So that's diversity. So the other thing we often hear about is uh, inclusiveness. And uh, I hear many people come to me and say, you know, I, I've heard from students, I've heard from students of color in particular, they don't feel welcome, they don't feel a sense of belonging. And we always want to be sensitive to those. But what I, what I ask you to do is to show us, I don't think many people realize we do have a, a pretty informative survey that we actually did do to try to identify whether there are so-called inclusion gaps. Because it's, it's one thing to say students don't feel included. It's another to say students of color feel less included than white students, than majority students. So does the survey tell us that or do we need more research to identify that? 
Thank you, Elliot. So just to touch on the survey that Elliot is referencing, in order to gather student perceptions on their sense of belonging and campus climate, the college did administer a survey in fall 2020 through the Higher Education Data Sharing Consortium on diversity and equity. The survey was administered to all enrolled students in the semester. IVC uh, administered the survey as well. We had a 6% response rate, which is very typical of our online uh, uh, online surveys, and for the most part, the respondents' characteristics were very reflective of our student populations in that 70% were female, 60% were white, 22% Latinx, 2% uh, African American, about 36% younger than 25. So to address student feelings of inclusion, I'm going to briefly review the survey results on student perceptions of campus climate, which includes these ideas of sense of belonging and their experiences with discrimination and harassment. Um, <clears throat> as a side, this is our college's first administration of this survey. So the data we did collect will be used as a baseline. And we do anticipate uh, administering this survey again in fall 2022 to see if there is a change in these results. So first, what the survey actually does is compares our results to other institutions. So uh, the first piece of the survey is on campus climate. Uh, here we see the perceptions of our students compared with all of these other institutions that participated in the, in the survey, which are a total of 110 four-year and two-year schools. Uh, a majority of the institutions were four-year colleges. We only had 13 two-year colleges. So there is a slight limitation of the comparison to community colleges, which we'll get to. Um, but the results did show that higher percentages of our students were more satisfied with campus climate, felt that our community members experienced a sense of belonging and agreed that the campus is free from tensions. To further highlight this, 80% of our respondents were satisfied with our overall campus climate. Additionally, when compared to these institutions, our students had more than 15% higher levels of satisfaction on community members experiencing a sense of belonging and our community being free from tension. So now we're gonna take a look at how we compare to other community colleges that participated in this survey. So here, when compared to the other community colleges, there is a slight shift in these three components that I just spoke to. Again, it is important to note that there were only 13 colleges that were included in this in the survey. So based on the comparisons, data revealed that student perceptions at other CCs were roughly 10% higher in regards to community members' experiences, sense of belonging, and the campus being free from tensions. Uh, HEADS, the, the company, the, the Higher Ed Consortium, has recruited more community college to participate in the next round of the survey. So this is an area we can revisit when we administer the survey a second time. Okay. okay, it looks like we're doing pretty well, you know, when compared to other colleges in the overall numbers, but when I see 79% satisfied with our overall campus climate, I think 21% dissatisfied. Um, and, and maybe, you know, that's typical among college students, but how do we know, is there a way of identifying whether our students of color, for instance, feel more dissatisfied than our student, than our, our majority students? I, I don't want, if that 21% is disproportionately minorities, that's not a good thing. So is there, do, have we dug down to see that? We have, Elliot, I'm gonna to get to that in just, just on the next, next couple of slides. Thank you for that. So next, to further assess campus climate as a whole, um, students were asked to rate their level of satisfaction on a five point scale, with one being very dissatisfied to five being very satisfied on these four items. Of these four items, two specifically address a sense of belonging. So when we go into the mean scores across these four items, we find that this chart breaks down these mean scores based on that five point scale uh, by different student populations. So we have the yellow bar is your overall mean score of 4.05. And it's important to state that any score with four or above indicates a high level of satisfaction. So data revealed that our students 
are generally satisfied with our overall campus climate, which is inclusive of students' sense of belonging. Uh, we do have minor gaps with our LGBTQIA+, non-binary, and students with disabilities, but it is very important to note that there are almost no gaps with students of color, which make up about 40% of our survey respondents. To further break down the persons of color category to ensure to see sort of their mean scores across the different ethnic groups, we noticed that there's a notable, noticeable difference. There was not a noticeable difference uh, in average scores for students of color. He, we broke out the scores into the larger ethnic groups for further assessment. Data showed that across the board, we averaged a score of four or higher. If there were major differences found, it would be a signal of inclusion gaps, but we are not seeing that among our ethnic groups of the survey respondents um, to the survey. So um, as far as our ethnic groups and their perceptions of sense of belonging and overall campus climate, we are not seeing any major differences as far as their perceptions of, of their experiences at the college and their sense of belonging. That's one section of the survey which relates to campus climate. The next survey, the next section, which relates to also uh, inclusion, is really their experiences with discrimination and harassment at the college, if they've had any sort of uh, direct experiences. So here, here, students were asked if they had directly experienced any occurrences at Saddleback College or at any off-campus program affiliated with the college. Roughly 86% of our respondents reported having never experienced discrimination or harassment at the college, with only 7% stating they had. When compared to other participating um, institutions, our students had a higher percentage of not experiencing any discrimination or harassment, about 14% higher, which, which looks really good when, when comparing, these include four-year universities and all of our two-year colleges as well. Uh, when we go, when we compare it to other community colleges, the, although the difference does get smaller, our students still had a higher percentage of not experiencing harassment or discrimination. So, what about that 7% of students who did experience some harassment is who are those students? So if we look at the 7% that did respond to having experienced a level of discrimination or harassment, students with disabilities and those from the LGBTQIA community were the two groups that experienced the most. Uh, although it is not shown here, the primary source of discrimination or harassment of these students were from other students. So this should give us solace in knowing that it is not our campus community that may have caused the discrimination or harassment. The primary source is from other students. And the two largest populations are our students with disabilities and the LGBTQIA+. And Shuka, we, we probably want to point out, first of all, the students with disability was a surprise to me when I saw this. We don't often talk about that as a disproportionately impacted group because they tend to do pretty well academically. Um, but here you see that despite the supports we give them, they do experience uh, more harassment or discrimination. I would point out that some of that sense of discrimination may be because of the physical environment and not necessarily because of people. And we are addressing that through our multi-million dollar ADA uh, reform plan that is changing the accessibility across campus. So hopefully that will help, but I do think this is a group we don't often talk about and we probably need to talk a little bit more about. So that the head survey is very helpful in identifying where we have potential inclusion gaps, probably not where most people thought, uh, a little bit for LGBTQIA, uh, a little bit for non-binary students. Uh, here in the harassment discrimination section, we see it with students with disability. It looks like we're doing a little better than most people think when it comes to students of color. And that's pretty good news on the inclusion front. Um, when it comes to equity, Shuka, you and I know uh, we do have some gaps and they do impact uh, students of color as well as other disproportionately impacted groups. So let's talk about those because we often refer to these achievement gaps or equity gaps or the most modern term now is opportunity gaps where the overall completion or transfer of our students 
um, is not equal across the demographic groups. And before you jump into these, I always like to tell people, and I'm so sorry if you're sick of me here at saying this, but you, you can't even think in your head, hey, it's just because some groups don't do as well because there have been colleges that completely close these gaps. So if they are able to do it, you can't say it's about the group, it's about us. Moreover, as you're about to see, yes, Shuka and I have talked about this in advance, in case we weren't coming off totally genuine. Um, <laughs> as you're about to see, uh, we actually have done some good work in closing gaps ourselves. And that work is to be first celebrated, but also modeled and replicated. So Shuka, you know, one thing when we looked at Aspen, first, show us, show us the equity gaps we do have. We should first identify those for people. Sure. So the opportunity gaps at the college were most recently identified through the baseline data of our current strategic plan. So the data did show that our Black African American students, Latinx, first generation, and students 25 and over have the greatest gaps in three primary metrics. So credential completions, transfers to four-year universities, and completion of transfer level English and math within the first year. So, but counter to some beliefs, uh, our low income students were not found to have major opportunity gaps, which, which again, um, uh, there, there are areas that we need to focus on, but that is the one group that, you know, we did not find major gaps. The target goal of our college Oh, go ahead, Elliot. No, I, I was just going to say, I just want to jump in on that because we want to point out that's because of good things that people are doing. I think the way we have addressed non-academic barriers has been successful. It is a success story that we do not have an opportunity gaps uh, for low-income students. Sorry, Shubha, go ahead. No, no worries. And lastly on this, I think our target goal based on our STRAT plan and, and other efforts we have on the college is to eliminate these gaps by 24-25 through systematic approaches that Elliot referenced earlier. And to address these efforts, we have seen some successful gains in minimizing gaps. And I'm gonna highlight two of our programs in a little bit that have uh, achieved minimizing these gaps through our AB705 efforts and our PROMISE program. Okay. So first, I wanted to speak to you guys about the implementation of AB705. And for those of you who may not be familiar, AB705 is a state initiative that took effect in 2018, and it requires all California community colleges to maximize the opportunity for students to enter and complete transfer level coursework, specifically in English and math. Uh, the focus is to remove academic barriers, such as developmental classes, uh, which were found to be bottlenecks for students in achieving their educational goal or transferring um, or, or attaining their degrees. At Saddleback, we've implemented AB 705 in fall 2018, partially and fully in fall 19. And part of the changes included the development of a guided self-placement model, uh, removal of many developmental classes. And through these changes, our college has been able to give access to transfer level English and math classes to every student. And now we are seeing some promising re results in completions. The chart you're seeing right now displays the one year completion rate of transfer level English classes across four academic years, uh, where the colored lines represent the outcomes of white, Latinx, Black African American students with blue reflecting the overall rate. These students are all first time college students with an ed goal of degree or transfer. So when assessing gaps by ethnic groups, over the last several years, since the implementation of AB705, Latinx one-year transfer English uh, rates have risen 23%. And the great news is the gap between white and Latinx students has almost been eliminated with a decrease from about 13% to two. Uh, for our Black African-American students, one-year transfer level English completion rates have also risen but the gap between white and black students has remained at 13%. Now, one critical point I, I have to highlight is not to overinterpret the results of our black African-American students because they make up about 2% of our incoming first-time college students um, compared to our 33% of Latinx. So this is really great for our English completions that our Latinx students are minimizing that gap between our white students. But again, some work still needs to be done in, in minimizing the gaps for our African-American students. Um, and, and the other success story with it is the narrowing 
pretty much closing. I mean, the way the three, the three graphs come together in the most recent year, Shuka, we've almost closed the equity gaps. That's a closure of equity gaps. It's a major so, success. So guess what? We, we didn't get the Aspen eligibility notice by accident. This is the kind of data that they've been looking at. So good work to everyone who's been part of the success uh, in upping these rates of completion of college level English in the first year for all students, for all boats. Thank you all who have been part of that. Go on, Shuka. Exactly. So next is our one year math completion. So over the last several years, the completion rates for our Latinx students has, has risen incredibly 19%. Uh, but the gap between white and Latinx students has remained at about 5%. So again, some work that needs to be done there. Uh, for our Black African American students, again, the completion rates have increased by 10%, but the gap uh, unfortunately has widened a bit from about 5% to 14%. So a little bit more work that needs to be done with math completion, but again, major kudos to those completion rates. I mean, that's um, almost a doubling of completion rates. Yes, exactly. Kudos so, math folks. Exactly. And then lastly, for AB 705, we have completion of English and math within the first year. So here we see Latinx has again increased 18% in their completion. Um, and, and the gap between white and Latinx students has slightly minimized from about 5% to 4. So not a major, major decrease, but again, something to, to pat on the back. Again, our Black African American students has increased, the completion rate has increased by 12%. Uh, but the but the gap again between white and um, African American students has has increased from about four to nine. So overall, when thinking about AB seven hundred five, our college has eliminated access barriers to transfer level English and math coursework, and we are seeing huge gains in our one year completions. Notably, the gap between our Latinx students and completion of transfer level English classes has almost been eliminated but there's still work uh, that needs to be done in narrowing the gaps further among our DI or disproportionately impacted groups. So Shuka, AB 705 was one area we really talked a lot about in our response to uh, the Aspen nomination. Um, the other area is promise. So where we saw huge gains in completion of college level math and English from AB 705, we also are seeing big gains from the promise program. So promise was pretty prominent in our application to Aspen. Do you wanna tell, tell us a little bit about the success we see there? Absolutely. And I think for today, we're going to focus on one metric, which is persistence rate for Promise. But again, for those of you who may not be too familiar with our Promise program, uh, it was implemented in 2018, and its goal was to remove non-academic barriers, where AB 705 was to remove more of an academic barriers like developmental courses. Uh, in Promise, removal of uh, barriers such as finances for incoming first-time college students, like registration fees, book costs, health fees, um, by eliminating these fees so that a student can achieve their educational goal, goal more efficiently. Uh, eligible students in this two-year program have all their fees paid and also receive more of a case management uh, based on needs they may have for other services. Uh, in this coming fall, 2022, the college will be starting its fifth cohort of our Promise program. So although students in the program have gains in a couple metrics like English and math completions and, and other items, I'm going to focus on the persistence that I had mentioned, um, which essentially is fall to fall persistence, which essentially means a student enrolled in a given fall term re-enrolls in a subsequent fall term. So the chart you're looking at right now displays the fall to fall persistence of our first three promise cohorts. Uh, currently we're in our fourth cohort and it compares them to students that were not in the promise program but had similar characteristics. So on average, promise students persist at a higher rate than non-promise students, uh, roughly 18% higher when you're looking at cohort three. So there is a notable, we do notice there's a decrease in the overarching persistence rate across time, uh, but this is primarily due to the impacts of the pandemic. But again, the Delta huge gains between non-promise cohort or non-promise students and our promise cohorts. So the next three slides are, are really going to break down the fall to fall persistence rate of each of these three cohorts by Latinx, white students and low income students. Uh, since removal of financial barriers was the goal of the program, we felt that 
the outcome of the low income students should be included in this presentation. Also, as a side, which is a huge gain, the distribution of Latinx students in our PROMISE programs is about 35%. So PROMISE already serves more Latinx students than our college in proportion of 25%. So this is a huge, huge win for us at all uh, as well. Um, it is also important to know due to the extremely small number of Black African-American students in PROMISE, their data was suppressed, which is why you, you aren't seeing it here in these slides. So for cohort one, we see that the persistence rate for all groups is in the 90s for all promise groups. And the gap between Latinx and low income students compared to white students is about three to 4% lower. Um, in comparison with cohort two, we notice that although the overarching persistence rate fell a little bit, the gap for Latinx and low income students was minimized to about two to three percent. So again, between cohort one and cohort two, we do see a narrowing of the gap between Latinx and low-income students in comparison to the white students. Now with cohort three, we did have a huge influx of the number of students participating in Promise, went from about 400 plus to about 1200 plus, uh, but this cohort started in the middle of the pandemic. So this is something to really be proud of. They started in the middle of the pandemic, and even though the overall persistence rates, again, are decreasing, our Latinx and um, um, low-income students still persisted at a higher rate than non-promise Latinx and low-income students. Specifically, Latinx promise students persisted only about 4% less than white students, and the gap between low-income and uh, white students was eliminated. So really they were persisting at the same rate as our reference group. And I have to say, Shiga, we actually it's actually a narrowing of the equity gap for Latinx students. It was originally 71 to 65 and then 86 to 82 for the Promise group. So we actually narrowed it a little bit. Narrowed it a bit, yes, exactly. So through the efforts of the Promise program as well, similar to AB 705, there are observable gains in minimizing gaps between our Latinx, low income, and even with African-American, um, Black African-American students in AB 705. Uh, currently, cohort four is in progress, so we will know about their outcomes once this academic year closes out and we'll report at a later time. So that is, that is the general takeaway from Promise and AB 705. And Which are huge successes and they're data informed and we have the data to prove that the initiatives work. Um, and, and the reason, you know, we often talk about persistence and completion of, of college level math and English in the first year is because those things correlate with a high level of student completion. In other words, once you get through fall to fall, you are far more likely to complete, right, Chuka? Once you get through your, if you do get through English and math at college level in your first year, you are in a group that is far more likely to complete. There are strong correlates. When we get down to either even smaller levels, one thing that I've talked to you about, one thing I've talked to others about is course completion, like even getting through a course. If there's some place we can start, and many colleges have taken this approach, it's, it's a way to model an effort after an existing gap. So do we, as if I didn't know what the next slide shows, do we, Shuka, have a gap in course success based on the demographics of our, stu of our student body? Why, thank you, Elliot. <laughs> So through a gap analysis, we found that at a college level, our Black African-American students and Latinx students have substantially lower course success rates than compared to the average. As an additional systematic approach, the college will be focusing on addressing opportunity gaps in course success. And again, successful completion of courses, as Elliot mentioned, is the foundation of all of our key performance indicators, such as credential completions, transfers to a four-year, math and English completions. So based on the snapshot from our course success rate equity dashboard, which I'm previewing here for you today, the red bars that I know it's, it's a little bit hard to see are the two like Black African-American students and our um, Latinx students. We noticed that, <clears throat> excuse me, Black African-American students on average their average course success rate is 11% less than the average, than our white students, with the Latinx students about 6% less. So as one strategy to address these gaps, we are taking on a systematic approach in our educational planning and assessment committee to include 
course level equity data, which will be in the form of this dashboard that you're seeing in all of our program reviews and administrative unit reviews. We will be asking department chairs and unit managers to reflect on activities or efforts taking place or those that could be developed within their areas that would help address or minimize these gaps. Through this effort, we are hopeful and we will be able to tackle the issue as a college in, in a systematic way. So again, just a plug for those who are interested, EPA will be hosting a session on inclusion of equity data into PRs and AURs later this week. So hopefully we'll see some of you there. Um, but again, this is our college's approach to addressing our gaps or opportunity gaps within course success. So my plea to everybody today is to come together and take this very systematic intentional approach with all correlates to completion, but specifically this one that remains unaddressed, which is course completion, not just English and math course completion, but all course completion. So identifying where we have the biggest equity gaps, which classes are the most troublesome on MOS, not individual classes, um, and figuring out what we can do to support those classes, what interventions we can do to help students over these non-academic barriers. I also want to point out before uh, we, we let Shuka go, um, Shuka, thank you so much for, for doing this with me, that you know the successes we have need to be continued and scaled. That's another big learning from Aspen is, is it scalable? Can you do more? And oftentimes we have to answer, uh, we're not sure. Uh, well, these are scalable things. We, we can take take promise and take the learnings from promise and, and provide it to all new incoming students. We can take the learnings of AB705 work that have been done in English and math as we're doing and apply them to all students. They are scalable. So we don't want to neglect these big successes that we've had. And indeed, we still have more work to do, but we want to celebrate them and model them and replicate them and take them to scale. Similarly, the fact that we don't have inclusion gaps based on student race, the fact that we aren't seeing equity gaps based Based on low income doesn't mean we should ignore those things. It means woohoo, we're doing well in those things and we need to continue and not necessarily turn down the burner too low on those things. But right now on the front burner, we need to focus on equity based on the opportunity exact gaps that exist for students of color. And that can be a course completion. It can be at a number of different correlates, but here's one staring us in the face in the data. So my ask of everyone is that we come together in EPA, in program reviews, in many different modalities um, and find ways to address this together and collaboratively because it's our way. Shuka, thank you. Um, thank you for the feigned dialogue so that we could pretend we were like a nerdy talk show for 25, 30 minutes. It was, <laughs> it was fun to have you on our nerdy talk show. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. It was wonderful to see you. And Shuka, will you stop sharing? And then I can close out and bring on Margo. Um, welcome back, faces. I like having the faces there. I miss you all when you're away on screen share for so long. Um, so I want to close uh, saying this. Um, just before we went on break, about a week before we left on break, I did a Friday update about um, civility and the importance of civility and professionalism at all times in our work um, and the rash, uh, it seems, of incivility that we are witnessing as people find themselves under stress. And I want to reiterate that and bring that up today in the context of yet another wild ride on this roller coaster that we're experiencing. It is no less important when people are stressed that we remember the importance of those filters and the need to be professional and kind and civil and supportive of each other. And I'm gonna close with a little story that's not a very fun story, but I, I think it's worth sharing with you. Uh, back in, I think it was about October, I took a day off uh, and my husband and two close friends of ours went to Disneyland for the day. Um, and it was at, at one of those troughs, you know, between Delta and Omicron, I, I was very safe. I wouldn't have gone to Disneyland right now, thank you. Um, but bless all the people who are supporting Disneyland uh, as I speak, somebody needs to. Um, but, I, you know, I'm not a roller coaster person. I really am very afraid of roller coasters. I'm also very prone to motion sickness. So you have to take roller coasters off the table for me. So our friends kind of engineered the whole day for us at both parks. And they started with the history of rides and things that you do at Disneyland, right? Going from the very first things, the, the tiki theme things from the very history of Disneyland, all the way through the Avengers ride, the, the Spider-Man ride, which was just amazing and so cool. And along the way, we, we avoided the roller coasters because I don't do roller coasters, but we did do Splash Mountain, which 
is kind of a roller coaster on water, but it doesn't feel like it. I mean, I've done log rides since I was a kid. And other than the last big plunge, you know, which is a little bit scary, it was fine. So based on that, they said, well, you know, I think we should do Space Mountain because it also doesn't look like a roller coaster. And it's not really a roller coaster. They fake the speed by having wind blow by your face and by having this high energy music pumping. So it's just sort of simulated speed. So it's really fun. You like driving fast in your car, right, Elliot? Oh, sure, that sounds like a lot of fun. So I'm like, you know, a 15 year old idiot. I got talked into doing something by friends. So I go on Space Mountain. And those of you who are covering your face and laughing, you've been on Space Mountain before. It is a blessed roller coaster. But here's the thing. It's a roller coaster built inside a tube, so you don't know where you are in space or on the roller coaster. It is a freak show for people who don't have control issues. It's super fun if you can just let go, and that's not me. And being in a roller coaster and not knowing when the ride was going to be over or what the next turn was or you know, whether we were about to go faster or slower at any moment was terrifying. And I, my equilibrium was affected, but also my psychological equilibrium was affected. And I faked it because I didn't want to ruin the day for everybody else. And I went on and after gaining my physical equilibrium for 20 minutes sitting on a bench outside, we went on with the day and I'm glad I did because we had a great day. So please don't think that they ruined my day or that I have terrible friends, they meant well. But the reason I share that story is because we are on Space Mountain right now. It isn't just a roller coaster. It's a roller coaster where we can't figure out where we are on the roller coaster. There's no orientation. We don't know when we're at the top of the hill or the bottom of the hill. We don't know when the next turn is coming. We're in a roller coaster in a tube with a bunch of fake stars lit all around us. It's completely disorienting. It's incredibly stress stressful. And it is the most difficult working condition that I can imagine for managers, for faculty, for our classified professionals. If you think you're the only category, whoever you are, that's been working harder for the last 20 months, you need to get out more and talk to your colleagues because my faculty are just killing it out there every day, dealing with COVID in the classroom, online or on ground. Our classified professionals are killing it, trying to do good jobs and be good to students and the people they support while all this stress is hanging over. And our managers who get no respect and unfairly not enough gratitude, they have been killing it for 21 months. So thank you, my colleagues, for everything you are doing. But here's the final point from this. Just as a roller coaster can be so disorienting and so difficult, the last thing in the world we want to do when we're in that situation is be unkind to one another, to be uncivil to one another. This is the time to be the kindest. This is the time to be the most empathetic. This is the time to go out of the way to show gratitude for the smallest things that our colleagues and our students do. The worst of the times is the time for us to be our best selves. And this is the worst of times. It is about to get better. And there is a horizon out there with a sun coming up. But while we are still on this roller coaster, and until it slides into the final exchange of passenger area, we need to be good to one another. And we need to be good to our students. And it needs to be intentional and conscientious every day. And I have zero tolerance for anything that falls short of that, because we are too important to one another and we are a family and we are gonna treat each other that way. So thank you. Thank you for being good to one another. Thank you for tolerating this ridiculous roller coaster for yet another wave. And we hope it's our last one, or at least that the ride is almost over. At this point, I wanna bring in uh, my close colleague and, and my friend as well, Dr. Margot Lovett, the president of the Academic Senate. And you know, Shuka and I, talk in a big nerdy uh, talk about the data and the big picture of how we do things at our college and how activities under various initiatives work. Um, and Margot, Dr. Lovett is really good at the human side of that. How do we apply it? How does it work in our own lives, professionally, personally, and where does 
uh, the rubber hit the road, if you will. So with that, um, I'm going to kick it to Dr. Lovett. And when Margo is done, if there is time left over, we will take any questions that people have. Thank you for all being here. It's a pleasure to see you all. Margo. Thank you, Elliot. Um, so I, what I've got up on my computer, everybody, is I've pulled up some notes that I'm going to be speaking from. So I cannot see myself, which means I hope that you can all hear me. Elliot, I can see you. So can you nod if if you can hear me? Perfect. Should, should I right. tell you? Should I tell you when things go wrong on your screen, Margo? <laughs> sure. You have you're looking good. All right, and I saw Ryan too. So Ryan, you can you can also um, monitor. Thank you. So um, you know, it, as I was thinking about what I wanted to say today, what kept occurring to me is is how random life is. Right. And, and Elliot has alluded to this with with Omicron. Right. Um, and that's made me think how much of our life experiences really are influenced by the choices that others made or by factors that we have no control over and broadening that away from COVID. You know, I've thought that I'm in many ways, I'm really lucky. I was really lucky to be born into a middle class white family that didn't have to worry about affording basic necessities and food, clothing, shelter, and could afford luxuries, vacations, um, to eat out in nice restaurants. I've been thinking how I was lucky that almost paradoxically, my grandfather changed our family name in 1925 when my father started kindergarten and that was done to protect him. And then later on, my sister and me from anti-Semitism. I'm lucky that my family, we don't look Jewish, which again protects me from anti-Semitism. I'm thinking how I am physically and mentally healthy, yeah, for the most part right now. I'm thinking how lucky I am that I'm straight passing, which has protected me from homophobia. And especially I think about how my white skin has protected me from racism and how I have things that others don't. So all of these things constitute the basic components of my identity. I'm white, Jewish, female, middle-class, bisexual, able-bodied, mostly mentally healthy, straight passing, female presenting. So what, if you will all indulge me, I'd like to ask everyone here to think about the basic components of your own identities. And if you, uh, you know, I still use pen, pen and paper. Um, so if you have a piece of paper handy, take a piece of paper, or if you wanna write on an iPad or your computer and just jot down the following things. How would you define your race or ethnicity? What about your gender? What about your class position? Your sexual identity, which I prefer to sexual orientation. And finally, your gender display. And what that means is how you present your gender to the world, right? And then as a reverse, how your gender is perceived by others. And finally, do you have uh, physical or mental challenges? Now, after writing those down, I want you to think about how each of these components has either made your daily life easier or more difficult. So for instance, how does each one influence the way you're treated at work? How do they influence your social interactions with strangers? So workers in stores or service professionals. How do those components of your identity influence your dealings with bureaucracy or authority figures? And are there any parts of your identity where there are situations where you are concerned for your personal safety? Okay. And now I'd like to um, ask people to answer yes or no to the following statements. And I'm gonna read a bunch of them. Number one, in my professional life, most of my peers or colleagues at my same rank share my race or ethnicity. So yes or no. My professional successes or failures are not viewed as a reflection, positive or negative, on my racial slash ethnic group, gender or sexuality. 
Three, if I rent or buy a house in a nice neighborhood, I can be pretty sure that my neighbors will be pleasant or neutral to me, yes or no. Next, in media and popular culture, I see people who look like me widely and positively represented. At school, I learned about the positive contributions that people of my racial slash ethnic background made to US history. At school, I learned about the positive contributions that people of my gender made to US history. And I could add sexual identity to that list as well. Next, I or my children do not have to be aware of systemic racism for our own safety or daily physical protection. I or my children or my family, right, we can expand that, do not need to be aware of homophobia or transphobia for our own safety or daily physical protection. If I interact with members of law enforcement, I am not afraid for my own physical safety. I can be reasonably sure that if I ask to talk to the person in charge, I will be facing someone who looks like me. Only two more. I can do well in a challenging situation without being called a credit to my race or my gender. And the last one, which is some comic relief, but not really. I can buy flesh colored band-aids and have them more or less match the color of my skin. Okay, so my assumption is that the white men in the group answered yes to just about all of these statements. The white women answered yes to most of them and people of color answered no to most. So what all of this is getting at is ways in which all of the various components of our identities do or do not confer us with privilege. And to put it another way, these various components of our, of our identity either make our life easier or more difficult. Okay, I can't claim credit for that list because I, I will actually like a good, good historian, I will cite my source. I adopted most of the preceding examples from a groundbreaking article published in 1988 by the feminist scholar and anti-racist activist, Peggy McIntosh. And this is called, the article is called White Privilege and Male Privilege. This is 1988, everybody. So we've been talking about this for a long time. In that article, McIntosh came up with a list of what she called unearned advantages or privileges that she personally benefited from over the course of her life. And she came up with this great phrase. She defined white privilege as, quote, an invisible knapsack or package of unearned assets that white people can count on cashing in every day, but about which we are meant to remain oblivious, right? It's supposed to be secret, hidden, which means norm. We are, we are, our experiences are normal. So, to go back to the exercise with which I started my comments, what that demonstrates is that privilege, the way I've come to define privilege, again, borrowing from Macintosh, it's an unearned advantage someone gets, not because of anything they've done to merit or deserve it, but simply because of the color of their skin, their gender, their class position, their sexuality, their ability status, and so on. So I personally have white privilege and class privilege. I do not have gender privilege or sexual identity privilege. And those are important to know. Now, when I say that a straight white male, middle-class male has privilege, I, I'm not, and others, it's just not me. The, the point of this isn't to make him feel guilty. Right, And it doesn't mean that he didn't have to work hard to succeed. It doesn't mean that his life was always easy. But what it does mean is that when compared with a person of color or a woman at the same economic level, social status, fill in the blanks, his way to success is easier, right? Because of privilege, 
his daily life is easier. So this is how privilege is connected to inequity, right? If some of us benefit from these unearned advantages, that means that others are penalized or oppressed because they lack them. And I wanna join the work of another scholar here, law professor Kimberly Crenshaw in the 1980s, which was a great decade, developed the term intersectionality, right? Which she explained in a recent TED talk was to quote, deal with the fact that many of our social justice problems like racism and sexism are often overlapping, creating multiple levels of social injustice. So it's not just that you're a woman, but that you're a woman of color, that you're a lesbian, that you're low income, that you are, that you have an ability, you're, you're, I hate the term disabled, but I'll, I'll, you're, you're, you've got challenges. Every one of those factors intersects to make your life sometimes really, really hard, right? So what does this have to do with Saddleback? And what can we do about this in our classes? Well, I would say there are several things we can do. Number one is we need to acknowledge that privilege exists and those of us who are white need to not feel defensive or guilty when someone says we have privilege. I have privilege as, a, as I said, a white middle-class woman. So the first thing I need to do is not to be defensive and to really, really get the reality that there is not and never has been a level playing field. Right. Um, well, I have an anecdote I, I might go into later about that. We need to acknowledge that some of our students, just like some of us, have advantages that others do not. Right. And we have to consider how what we think about our students sets them up either for success or for failure. And this is going back to what Elliot said earlier about we cannot explain differences in success rates by saying, oh, you know, fill in the blank, that group just, you know, doesn't whatever, right? As he said, the issue is not them, it is us. So here I wanna offer another term that ties in with this. And this term is uh, a controlling image. This was developed by the sociologist Patricia Hill Collins, guess when, everybody, in the 1980s. So we've been thinking about these issues for almost 40 years. And Collins developed this while theorizing about the existent experiences of Black women. She herself is African-American. I'm going to give you a very, very short definition of controlling image, it is a negative stereotype about historically marginalized groups of people, people of color, um, uh, women, non-binary people, non-queer people, right? Controlling images serve a purpose and the function is that they make the oppression of these groups of people, again, women, people of color, LGBTQ plus people seem legitimate. And they do that by reinforcing gender, racial or sexual stereotypes about these groups. So let me give you some examples. They are everywhere. Our cultural spaces, the corporate news media, movies, advertising, sports, music, industry, all spread controlling images. And here are some of them. Black men are inherently violent and criminal, especially young black men. Black women are immoral. Girls are just not as good in math and science as boys. Straight Asian men and all gay men are effeminate and weak. And what I, I note with some, I, I don't even know what the word is, irony, that how terms connected with females are used to insult or devalue males, right? Lesbians are just frustrated women who really want to be men. Uh, Latinx men are domineering and hypermasculine or macho. Asian women are submissive. Latinx and Middle Eastern slash Arab women are oppressed. Um, an ambitious, assertive white man is praised for being a natural leader, 
but an ambitious, assertive woman is criticized for being a controlling bitch, right? So all of us have been exposed to these images. They are everywhere. And unless we are aware of them, they will influence what we think about each other, what we think about our students, the expectations we have for how our students will perform in our classes and how we treat them as a result. The last thing I wanna say about controlling images is for me, what, what is the, the most pernicious about these is that many of our students and colleagues who are the targets of these controlling images have internalized them and believe them about themselves. And as I said, for me, that is where these images are the most harmful. So everyone, as we go into this new year, we will get past Omicron, I know we will, and continue our focus on increasing student success and overcoming inequities in our classes and on our campus. All of us need to be mindful of these issues. The first step is understanding and knowledge. That's just the start, right? The really hard work comes after because what we need to do is change our policies and practices. It's not enough just to change our minds. Once we do that, all of us will benefit. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Margo, for what I hope is starting an important conversation um, that we need to have uh, across the college. And, we often um, are afraid and are put off by the word privilege, um, but part of that is getting through and understanding that you can grow up poor um, and still have privilege, that there are different forms of privilege. Many of you may remember uh, when I interviewed, and it is such a part of my life story that most people who know me well know that I often talk about it in, in, in part as an homage to my, my dear mother, um, who even though she was divorced and had no money and raised two kids, bought the only house she could afford in a neighborhood with a good school district so that my brother and I could have a good education. And indeed we did and could have better lives. And indeed we did. Um, but it was only years after I had told that story to a friend uh, that he finally got up the nerve, an African-American friend in Seattle, uh, to say to me, you know, that neighborhood that your mom bought the house in, was that suburban Detroit? I said, yeah. Uh, I said, was it Redline? Was it, was it was that neighborhood in the 60s when your mom bought her house, was that available to people of color? Um, and I suddenly remembered, because my mother was a realtor, her, her being screamed at by neighbors if she even showed a house to a person of color in many of those suburbs of Detroit. And indeed, it was redlined. Indeed, uh, someone who grew up with the same income level as I would as a kid, his parents were of color, would not have had the opportunity that I did. That's white privilege. I, I, I might not have had um, class privilege growing up. I certainly do now as an upper middle class male, but I had white privilege. And it, it doesn't mean I have to feel bad about myself to accept that. It just means I have to know I carry the backpack of assets um, that other people don't. And how can I help them achieve what they need to achieve when they don't carry that, that backpack of invisible assets on their back? So thank you, Margo. What, a, what an important conversation for us to start today. With that, I want to open it up. If there are any questions about COVID, about our DEI work, or the data we talked about, or the Aspen application, or any of the important concepts that Margo talked about today, myself, Shuka, Margo, we are all here to take your questions. So we're going to use the raise hand function rather than the chat function. Um, and as you pop up in the corner, raising your hand, it'll show those in order, as most of you know, being Zoom veterans by now. And Ryan will unmute you to uh, answer your questions. Deidre, how are you? I haven't seen you since, uh, it's been like, I think the last Winterfest, I think it was about a year and a half ago is the last time I saw you in person. It's I was on campus in spring for the shows and things, but yes. Um, I have two questions about COVID. Number one, given the information that you presented and, and the research that's out there, is there any thought to perhaps um, upping the mask requirement to medical masks while on campus for faculty, staff, and students? And then my other question is, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure there are conversations that we're not privy to about potentially bumping back that 
February 7th return to campus. And I was wondering if you could speak about, you mentioned obviously like the, you know, the positivity rate and the, the case numbers and things that have been used in the past, but, but what are the, what are the conversations that are occurring about that and when might we find out about them as faculty? So I'll, I'll do those questions in order, Dieter. They're both really good questions. So um, new return to work guidelines will be coming out from the district imminently, probably in the next uh, business day or two. Um, and those will upgrade uh, the mask recommendations um, to medical grade masks or consideration, as I mentioned here today, the possibility of wearing a tight cloth mask over your surgical mask. Uh, we, when, we, when you say, you know, medical grade, surgical is medical grade, but it's probably not ideal on its own. Um, I think for most people, it's fine. It's about a 75% effective filtration rate. So if everybody, if both you and the person with COVID is wearing it, your odds of getting enough aerosols to get sick are pretty low. So we know masks are good, even at the surgical level, but we might want to up it, particularly for people in the classroom or with a lot of contact students, we're recommending you consider that tighter cloth mask over the surgical mask. You may see a lot of healthcare professionals doing that too. Um, I think we're remiss to go as far as upping the requirement to a, surgery, a, a high filtration mask, an N95 or a KN95, um, because of what I alluded to, which is the, the potential for shortages in the healthcare community. Um, and also we don't wanna deplete the stocks. Uh, we are looking, uh, district procurement is looking for stocks of KN95s and N95s. Uh, and if we find large inventories, we will make them available to employees. But even then, you know, we're not going to have enough for students and students are going to say, well, what about us? So I don't want to suggest that an N95 is a requirement or needed at this point, and it won't be in the return to work. But you do raise this really good point that it is time for all of us to rethink about the mask we've been wearing. I know lots of people like their custom made pretty ones made of fabric. Um, it's time to lose that and consider putting that over a surgical mask. That double protection, again, will give you the equivalent of an N95. And by the way, it's a lot more comfortable than an N95. Um, what you wear, you know, on your own, what you purchase on your own is up to you. I'm, I recommend there are things that are just short of 95 that are much more comfortable. I like KN94s. They're those ones that look like a, a dog snout coming out because it provides space for your lips to move. So when you talk, um, it's more comfortable. Uh, you'll see uh, our, our chorus was wearing them um, in Feast of Lights. You'll see lots of other people wearing masks that give them more lip room, but they're very tight over the nose. One tip I have for you is if your mask doesn't have a metal strip that holds it to, that allows it to customize to the shape of your nose, it's not a good mask. All masks should have a metal strip. And I, and I wanna get to the second question as well, Deidre, and then, then I'll come back to it. it. Looks like you've got some follow-up. So the second question is, um, Chancellor's Executive Council meets once a week. We met even before we came back to work. We were talking by email, by phone. Uh, Chancellor Burke consulted with me and each of her uh, Chancellor's Exec uh, members and also consulted with the trustees before moving forward with this latest edition of Tapping on the Breaks. And we'll have the same consultative consultative process uh, going forward about whether 2-7 will be uh, carried forward beyond that. As I sit here today, I just don't know. Um, the modeling suggests that this could be a very sharp curve and a very rapid curve. Um, but I think one of the things that Dr. Burke and uh, her CEC members are gonna wanna talk about are what are the metrics going forward? Um, as I've said to you, I don't know that case number is the best metric if this turns into something that's more flu-like for vaccinated individuals, which is 98% of our workforce and probably an equal number of students. Um, then the metric might be for us to look at ICU capacity um, and to look at ventilator capacity. Right now, ICU capacity uh, in Orange County is very good. It's something like 20 some percent. I forgot the latest number. Uh, ventilator capacity is in the 60%. I think it might be 65% of ventilators are still available. So we are doing really well. But at the same time, this curve is, make, is creating a workload for hospitals, not necessarily in the ICU or, or a pre-death high-risk death phase, but just in, in the regular ER and in regular gen surge wards, it's creating havoc because 20% of OC hospitals, five of the 25 are reporting extreme work shortages, meaning they don't have enough workers 
to do this work. You know, you may know people are out with COVID, it's 10 to 20% are out right now across the country, it's up to 20% in healthcare. So we are reaching a point where the demand for healthcare, the need for it, is exceeding the supply. So as long as that's the case, my recommendation to Chancellor Burke, and, and I know uh, Kathleen is sensitive to this, will be that we extend. Because as a member of the community, we can't contribute to running out of hospital capacity. That It is our job to do everything we can to flatten the curve. But if we are over this curve in the next few weeks and rapidly descending it, I think the picture would be different. So the, the succinct answer, too late for that, is um, we don't have enough data yet, but, but we'll get there. And it looks like you had a follow-up, Dieter. Oh, sorry, we have to unmute you or you have to unmute yourself, one or the other. Okay, Ryan unmuted me again. Um, thank you for all of that. So can I, just to, to, to clarify, yeah. can we in our syllab syllabus then ask students or uh, not require perhaps, but recommend that they wear a surgical mask or, cause I mean, most of my students in fall wore flimsy little fabric masks and that was it. So is there language or is the district perhaps like you said in the next business day going to give language that then we can put in our canvas shells for our students? I think that's a great in, idea. In, in the class. Not only, not only do I embrace your idea as long as it's a recommendation to your students and not a requirement, but I, I will follow it up as well. I will do something to all students that will recommend that they, if, if available to them, wear surgical masks. And Lord knows we have hundreds of thousands in stock. They we can put them in your classroom <laughs> so they have no excuse. And then wearing a cloth mask over that is the best thing. So I will make that recommendation as well. I think that's a brilliant idea. And mm -hmm. I promise to follow up on it and do that. And, and we'll make sure that we order from the warehouse enough surgical masks. And we also have cloth masks um, so those are available for students. It's a great idea. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. You're, you're welcome to take any language in the return to work for employees and recommend it to your students. We're very careful not to mix those things up, like some of our rules for how we handle. Uh, I'll give you an example. One of the things we're working on right now that will be in the return to work is how we're going to handle it when an employee has had a contact with another employee who tests positive we are probably at the employee level going to be more restrictive than the guidelines that govern those decisions. And that would be from Cal OSHA and Cal DPH. We at the health center in dealing with contacts for students, we will follow the county guidelines, the most local guidelines, because that's what we usually do and what we're required to do. And those guidelines might not be identical. So there may be some things where you want to check in with HR or Jeannie or your dean to see, hey, is this something I can say to students? But generally, a recommendation, like the kinds of things I say to you all, you know, on a regular basis, Lord knows I should get in more trouble than I do, like don't eat inside restaurants. I mean, I'm killing the restaurant industry, right? They're having tough times. Take out from restaurants, don't eat inside. That's just my advice. It's a recommendation. It's not a requirement. And I speak to you as a member of my Saddleback family, not as the president of the college. So I think you can do the same things to students. I think that's very fair to do. And I will back up your recommendation uh, for masks. Um, looks like Nancy, Nancy, are you gonna turn your camera on? Come on. Thank you. Um, as usual. Hello, everybody. Happy New Year. Thank Hello, you, Nancy. Happy New Year. Three things to say. Thank you, Margo. You almost make me cry because talking about those privileges, from my own experience with Cadence, it is short. We were going to go for a walk. We just came downstairs. And a man, a white man, came to us. There were many white people around us. But this man came to Cadence and I and me and asked us if we are students. And I said, no, we are not students. And his answer was, question, so if you are not student, what are you doing here? I don't know if he's undercover security, what it was. That was uh, the experience of Cadence and myself. My talking about the privilege, we cannot blame people who have the privilege, especially if they are young from different generation because they have prepared all that for them, the new, generations 
They just need to be aware, conscient about it, and care a little bit for other people. Just care, being sensitive enough to care. My big issue is that if we are talking about improving life for everybody, why Saddleback College, that I consider my home, will not take the lead to solve this discriminatory system of paying part-timer to one percent now. Somebody needed to tell me if I'm teaching 61% or 100%. Dr. Stone, could you help me to teach only 61%? So when student come to me, I say, no, 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 I finished my 61%. Why Satan back cannot take a lead, not only for the state, but for the whole nation? to stop discriminating against us, to stop exploiting us, to pay us equal pay and equal benefit. And my last one is, Brian and I, we were lo looking at the completion team, the pathways, and we compare financial aid. I was shocked by the gap of Latino, I don't remember which year, 63% of Latino went to completion team and transferred. How many of them got financial aid? Only 9%. Why? Then we look at white people, 27% and 21% of them receive financial aid. So I would like us to look into that. What's happening really with financial aid? I don't know if Latinos are not applying or they are not being accepted. What's really going on? That's very, very important for me to do some work on that. I'm done. Thank you, Nancy. Let me address um, all three points. Even though you didn't ask me to address the first, I, I wanna thank you for it and point out that your point is really pulls together what Margot was talking about today and what I am talking about today. And that is, we're not looking to punish people or to make people feel guilty for privilege. We're asking those of us who have privilege in one area or another to have empathy for those who don't. It is about empathy. So when I call for empathy and gratitude um, while we are on this roller coaster, that is part of the empathy. It is recognizing that I have privilege that other people do not, and that the way that I am going to help us increase student achievement for all is by having empathy for people who don't have that backpack of assets on their back. So thank you for pulling those points together. The second point, now that we are out of bargaining, at least for a couple of years, um, there were huge gains that were made in the last contract uh, for lessening that gap between adjunct pay, uh, part-time pay, and full-time pay. Um, and that is largely thanks to the sacrifice that many of my full-time faculty colleagues in this room have made toward their own pay in terms of making sure that more of that delta went toward the adjuncts to try to narrow that gap. So we are making progress. Chancellor Burke, the trustees, myself, John Hernandez, everyone on CEC, we are all committed over time to narrowing that gap. But keep in mind, that the entire economic structure of higher ed, I, I have to be honest about this, it is all premised on the fact that we cannot deliver education at the price we do if everybody were paid at our full-time rate. And somehow we need to figure out a new model or a new way of raising revenue to make that additional money that we would need in order to raise everybody to that same level of pay. We have two classes of pay for faculty. It is inequitable, it is unfair. You, you have me on that, that's an easy one. Fixing it, that's the hard part. And I commit to you that everyone is looking at it. There was a significant amount of progress made in this current contract toward it, as you will see coming up in the next pay periods, I hope. 
Um, but we have work to do and we will continue to do that work. Um, I will take one quick question, Michelle, if you can do it really fast. Oh, and, and Nancy, we will look into the third issue. I think you raise a very good point because just because we don't see evidence of an equity gap for low-income students doesn't mean that all students have access to the supports that we've been targeting toward low-income students. So sometimes we look at equity and we forget about access issue. Are all students who need financial aid applying for it? Are they filling out FAFSA? We are very conscious of that in, in Promise, and we are looking at a concept where there might be people to basically hold the hand of, of folks who come through our enrollment process to make sure that, they, that all students avail themselves of financial aid opportunities, et cetera. So we are looking at it, and I promise you we will look at more data. And as a member of the faculty, I ask Ask you to work with Shuka to pull to, to pull together the data you want to see to ask for it and we'll identify that. Michelle, one quick question, and then we're going to get everybody a chance to say Happy New Year to one another, as is now our new annual tradition. Michelle, you're on. Camera, come on. Oh. I'm doing it. <laughs> you're better looking than me. Trust me, <laughs> no one else would say that. Um, I just have a quick question about testing and COVID. I I I'm wondering what the status is of that. I know I've talked to friends who teach out of the schools and they're basically, there are schools where they're testing students every day when they come in the classroom. And I'm, and I know that we're just planning on testing students who are uh, unvaccinated. Uh, and what is, what's the status on that? Or is there some system in place where this is going to happen? And how are the faculty going to know? Uh, so faculty will not know testing of who's getting tested and who's not unless somebody is pulled from their class because they got a positive test or because they failed to comply with the testing requirement. Um, you, would, you might be able to deduce that that was why that person was pulled off your roles, but it's important for you to check roles every day now if you haven't done that in the past to know who shouldn't be there, um, who might be there, who might show up even though they've been told not to. Uh, so no, we're, Are we, we going to be notified of that? Of who you should be, not be in our class? Yeah, your, your deans probably should have already notified you, but I'll make sure I'll work with Tram and the deans to make sure all faculty are aware of what's happening behind the scenes with those testing requirements for students with exam. No, no, no. Are we get, like if I have a student who is supposed to be tested every time, every day or every twice a week or whatever it is, uh, are we notified when they have not tested? So, or are they just going to drop off our roster? The latter. Yeah, we, we want to be careful not to stigmatize students with exemptions who are being tested as a result of having those exemptions, just like some of you, 2% of you have exemptions, and we don't want to stigmatize you by telling others other than your manager who needs to know so that they can schedule it, whether you are on that list or not. So we wanna be careful to provide students a, a bit of confidentiality about that, but where the confidentiality ends is if the student fails to comply or, or has a positive test. In that case, you would be notified and the student would be dropped from your roles. I, and another just follow up on what Deidre is saying, is there a reason why the college won't take a stronger stance than we should recommend to wear decent masks or, or medical grade masks or, you know, I mean, a recommendation is pretty much meaningless to most most people these days. So I'm wondering why the college is not taking a stronger stance on mandating that. Uh, I, I thought I was transparent about that, but let me reiterate. Um, we're afraid of taking away stocks that healthcare professionals may need. So requiring a mask that is in demand by healthcare professionals and may not be an adequate supply right now if the curve gets much worse would not be a good move as a member of the community. So there, there is there is adequate supply of masks right now. We're we're yeah. we're not having a mask shortage right now. So Michelle, that's why we're working for look to find stocks right now. If we do find inventory and are able to get it, we will. But as I said, you're I'm talking about where the curve is going, not where it is today. So if we're, we take all the stock of masks and institute a requirement to wear masks, and then we find that we need to give those masks to our local mission hospital because they're running low on masks, which you may remember happened in the first weeks of the pandemic to begin with, then we suddenly would have to pull the requirement. So I don't think we're looking at a requirement until we're sure 
the pandemic is not going to exceed the capacity of mask demand by healthcare professionals. And where we are today in mask inventory is a nice reassuring sign, but it's not the higher threshold that I'm looking for. So Finally, I do want to address, if I can just finish. Yeah, Michelle, let me, I need to get out of here and we need yeah. to let everybody get to their work. Um, but I do want to say this on your last point. Um, we are not looking, we do not have the capacity to test every student every day. There's also huge limitations in the testing supplies and also limits on testing reliability as an effective screen. Um, we are finding, I'm not referring to tests that are falsely negative, but I'm referring to the problem that people can test negative and have COVID and the next day be transmitting the disease. So unless you're testing every single day, and that is well beyond the capacity of Saddleback College, if you look at what's happening with U, uh, USDs, with school districts that have brought people back this week, almost none of them are testing students with that sort of regularity. Some uh, LA USD is testing once upon return to school. Some others are testing once or twice a week to try to catch things early. I got to tell you, that's not going to be a hugely effective screen with Omicron. Uh, so only testing every day would make a difference, and that's well beyond the capacity of any community college I know of and most universities. Sorry. Well, UC, UCSD is doing it. They yeah. have testing stations, and people can test as many times as they want for free. And is that required every day for students? I'm not sure if it's a requirement. I'll check with my friend, but her son goes there, and she said, yeah, he, has, he, he tests almost every day on campus. Yeah, we, we don't have the capacity to track that. And the other thing is if we're testing every day, even if we did track it, the only people who would be able to enforce it that day going to classes would be faculty. And I don't know about you, but I don't want most faculty put in the role of being police people to make sure a student has tested that day. That's an awkward position to be in to throw somebody out of class. And of course, we're not gonna ask our police force to go around and pull people out of class who didn't test that day. So super complicated question, I appreciate it. Uh, we're trying to increase the availability of testing on campus to the extent we can. We know there are testing shortages across the county. So we're in a tough way to try to do much ourselves to compete with the county. Uh, but we are doing our best to increase testing. In the meantime, those with exemptions will test twice a week. We think that's a bare minimum necessary to lower their risk relative to everyone else in the classroom, which again is one to is four or six times greater depending on the study of transmitting COVID. Finally, I wanna thank everybody for staying late. We went a few minutes over. Thank you for that. 244 people stayed, stayed with us. Wow, you are amazing. You have more patience than I would. Um, and we had over 340 people at the peak when I looked down. So that is just amazing. We all want community. We're all glad to be here together. So I appreciate that. So we are now going to unmute, but don't speak yet. So once we unmute, on the count of three, my three, Everybody will say Happy New Year. 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 Happy New Year